The following is an original audio series from Sierra International Machinery, Pile of Scrap, with your host, John Sacco. All right. Hello, 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 and welcome to a new episode of Pile of Scrap. I'm here with Brett Eckhart, United Metals Recycling. Brett, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it. it's great to be yeah. here with you. You know, I'm really impressed with what you're doing up here, and we'll get into that, but it's great to have you. You know, last night we got together and did some, we had dinner and we got some talking, and you're telling us about, you played some college football, and I was looking at you, and I decided, you know, I played high school football, and I was, uh-huh. I was a wide receiver, but I decided after you looking at you and going, guy's pretty thick, pretty tough, I don't think I would have been the receiver coming across the middle. I would not have liked to have met you on the football field. I think it would have hurt me a lot. <laughs> I did my best, you know. <laughs> I've actually cut down a little bit of weight just because it's. I was when I played football, I was a little bit thicker than I am today. So were you a middle linebacker? Middle linebacker. Oh, then you were the yeah. meanest dude on the field, right? I don't know. I I like to think I had. I combined uh, a little bit of meanness with a little bit of brains. So well, we'll see. I, I I know it's like ugh, I'm glad I didn't meet you on the football <laughs> field, but I'm glad I've gotten to meet you and get to know you here in the in this world that we delve in in the recycling. So football, there's a toughness that goes with that. And Correct. people who live in Idaho because of the winters, there's a toughness that goes with that, I've learned. Where did you learn your toughness? Was it just natural or was it, tell us about that. Because I think that de- defines you before anything else. Like I said, this guy is tough. I think the biggest thing with me is I was never the fastest. I was never the strongest, never the best looking, never any of those. I just, so I was always inherently just had to be a little bit tougher, a little bit more on the grind than some. I wasn't blessed with a crazy amount of athletic ability. I was blessed with enough to get me on the field, but I, anything I wanted to be over and above just on the field, I had to work my butt off for. So that to me just has transferred over into what I do today. Okay, so work. In our conversations, you started working with your father and your grandfather at a young age. Yes. Tell, us the his, tell us a little bit about that history and how it came for you and what you learned from that and how the history of United Metals. And give us a little bit of that history. So I grew up in a family scrap business, kind of like your, a lot of the other guys that, that you've done the podcast with. So pretty familiar story, but everybody has their own way of, going, of doing it. For me, it was... My grandfather started the business in uh, 1972. Um, My dad started as soon as he was able to uh, get out there and work, 16, started working um, full-time as soon as he graduated high school at 18. So I was able to watch my grandfather and my dad, specifically more my dad and my mom, just put in the hours and the time and develop the, the work ethic. So... Well, I, we were open on Saturdays, 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock, so I went down every Saturday with my parents before I could ever work in the yard. I watched cartoons in my grandpa's office on the TV, then I got a little bit older and I was able to watch Channel 6 and watch college football, and then by that time I was old enough that my dad said, all right. How old was that? How old were you when, when dad said, okay, get out in the yard and let's sort metals, pick up a broom, pick up I a little handbag? Eight to ten, somewhere in there. Well, I was started in the non-ferris, so I was able to go in there and help sort brass. We had a huge brass table, so I'd start by sorting the reds and the yellows and, you know, just basic brass sorting, then work my way up to helping strip copper wire, because at that time, there was no export market for insulated copper wire. If you had to either strip it or burn it or whatever you had to do to get it, you know, to get the plastic off. So, for me... That was the kind of the next step after sorting brass. And then the next step after that was in the recycling center, buying aluminum cans on Saturdays and non-ferris from the peddlers. So what did you like more? Knowing that you were working hard and getting your hands dirty or making the money that they were paying you? Because the reason why I asked, because for me, I, the thought of getting my hands dirty was just so cool. I wanted to be like the mechanics. I wanted to be like Shorty and... and, and and Clint, Clint was the first tech, uh, the, the guy who ran the scrapyard maintenance department. And they were dirty head to, I wanted to be like that guy because I could never get dirty as a kid. I'd go out and play in the garden, my mom would get mad at me. But if I was at work, 
I had an excuse. So what, were, yeah. what was it for you? Getting dirty dad, or getting money? My dad money? always say, what did you do? Just go outside and roll around <laughs> in the dirt? Like, what was it? What, was the, what the hell are you doing? And I'd be like, no, no. Because my, my biggest thing was being a you know impressionable 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, whatever it is, you're always, you get to see these older guys. They're in their 20s or 30s or 40s and out there working and busting their butt. So it's just as, the paycheck is nice, getting some money, but just going out there and, getting dirty and having fun and getting to do a lot of shit that most people don't get to do as a 10 year old kid. You don't get to go and throw rocks through cars, windows. And oh, watch that was the greatest. Bus we had auto park. Oh man, I, mean, I just couldn't wait yeah, to do it. I'd go out and break every window I could out of a car, <laughs> right? In my spare, I mean, whether I was working or not, like that was just, you don't get to, you don't get to go to a mall and, and break throw things. rocks through windows and nah. watch stuff break. But as a kid in a scrapyard, you get to, and so you get, you get to do stuff that a lot of kids don't get to do. Okay, so you get all your teenager, high school, you're playing ball. Now you're going to play college ball. Is in the back of your mind, I'm going to be in the scrap business. Is is this already set in your head? Not necessarily your father, or your grandfather. Your head is that set. That's where I'm going. When I was in high school, I told my dad, I was like, man, someday I want to work in the office, and. My dad's like, oh, yeah, you, we'll let you work in the office after you go to college. And I was like, but dad, dad, mom works in the office, you work in the office, and you guys didn't go to college. And my dad said, but if you ever want to work in the office, then you're going to go to college. So basically, I knew I enjoyed playing sports. I knew I, I was playing football at the time. So my way to be motivated to go to college was, A, to someday work in the office, and B, go play um, football in college. So I kind of got the best of both worlds for me. So you went and got your MBA, your master's, right? Yeah. You told an interesting story. Tell us what your thesis was, because I thought it was fascinating, your thesis about weather and pricing. Basically, I studied the difference of what drives more scrap flow into our scrap yards at the time, which was Boise and Caldwell and, and Mountain Home. What, what, what drives the flow more? Is it price driven or is it temperature driven? Because like you said earlier, you're asking about the weather and it gets nasty cold here for a couple months a year. We get snow, we get rain, we get all the, we get true four seasons in Idaho. And so my, I was trying to understand, is it price driven? Is it weather driven? Is it a combination of both? And the, what I figured out in our area is weather doesn't play nearly as much of a factor as price. If the price is $100 or better, you're going to get flow regardless of temperature. Regardless you're, if it's sub-zero or 80 yeah, degrees. It slows down a little bit for us when it gets down. If, if we get five, eight inches of snow overnight, that just stops everything. But generally speaking, temperature-wise, I didn't factor in snow or inches of rain or anything like that. It was more for me just say, is it price driven? Is it temperature driven? So conclusion, price drove. Price action. drives volume. I What'd mean, you get on that paper? Well, I mean, was there a grade on that? No, How does that work? No, when you do your master's, they either you pass or you don't. Like either they. Oh, what'd your professor say? They yeah. have to make a comment. Come on. Oh no, no, they 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 liked it. It was nobody had ever done that. Like you know, people do all kinds of reports, and they probably see a lot of similar type reports. You know, because there's a lot of people in the MBA program that are doing certain certain fields of their choice but they're very similar in the scrap business you don't see a lot of people trying to decide right. what's driving the the volume of scrap flow into the yards okay so you graduated what year when you got your mba well i graduated my undergraduate in 2004 and then i got my mba in 2000 and end of 2006 so because okay. I, I was working full time so i i graduated in 04 in the summer of 04 and that was when I was telling you about my dad. I graduated on Saturday, and my dad's excited. My mom's excited. I do the ceremony, I do the walk, and uh, I, my dad comes up, and he's just super proud, and I'm super proud. And, he, and I go, "All right, Dad, when do you want me to? When do you want me to start?" Thinking I had a couple weeks to go screw around and hang out. He goes, "Monday'd be fine." <laughs> so I'm like, I was given right. two weeks. Yeah, yeah that's uh, tough. Monday's I fine. Which. The, the, open the gates. That's that's yeah. fantastic. Okay, so interesting event happened prior to that, uh, late 90s, I believe. 
Your dad sold 50% of the business to Schnitzer Steel, correct? Correct. Okay, two questions about that. Why did they do that? And how'd that make you feel like, wow, am I gonna have this opportunity to go into the business? So the first question is, why did, why did that happen? So in 1997, my grandfather was uh, ready to retire. Um, my dad was ready to kind of put his twist on the business. Um, my dad had been working, doing it since he'd been in a teenager and he was ready to take the, the ball and run with it. And so at that time, the, the market was, was decent. The scrap, the scrap price was decent in 97 and a guy with Terry Moore and Jim Goodrich and they were doing business. My dad was selling scrap to uh, Schnitzer Steel at the time and they uh, they approached my dad about you know buying 50% of United Metals and basically using us as an Idaho affiliate to feed the shredder in Portland. Um, knowing that my dad, my grandpa needed to retire, that my dad was able to make a deal with Schnitzer at the time. Basically, it was what got us our first Sierra piece of equipment, about a 700 Sierra shear, and enabled us to. Um, Retire my grandpa. It's a liquidating a event that helped help the, get grandpa the next... to where he needed to go for retirement. Yeah. Okay, but as you're looking at that, now you're in high school and you're in college. You're, you know, look, you're not you're a smart guy. Are you seeing, hmm, my piece of the pie is small now, smaller because Schnitzer owns 50 and, and your family owns the other 50%. Did you look at that as a possible negative or did you embrace it and say, you know what? this still gives us the best opportunity for growth and what have you. The honest answer is in 1997, I was a sophomore in high school, so that was strictly a Rod and Debbie Eckhart, my mom and dad decision. Like they, 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 they needed to do what was best for the company and my grandfather at the time, and I didn't think positive or negative about it. I just knew that was, the, that was what had to be done. You know, that was, so for me, I didn't look at it in... I always knew what I was going to do. I always knew I was going to be in the scrap business. I mean, I always knew one form or another, like that was my calling. Like I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I liked everything about it. I liked that I can wear a jeans and t-shirt to work every day, a baseball hat. And like, that's my jam. That's your jam. That's cool. So, okay. So 2007, so that's 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. You guys, 2016, the family now you've been in the business now for a while you bought back your 50 percent yeah that's pretty cool that's really cool for, i mean it's cool for our family yeah and now it, it, i kind of got ahead of it because i want to backtrack now now you're back now you come into the business you know you're gonna you and your dad you have to figure out who's what what does the new buck get to do you've grown the business and your dad is so how did that work Give us a little bit about that and how you grew because you're you're up to eight yards now, okay? So mm -hmm. this just didn't happen in the last three years. You helped grow this company to where it is today. So how did you and your dad finally figure out the formula that lets Brett Eckhart help grow the company while your dad, Rod Eckhart, and your mom also help mold that growth? I think the biggest thing is my dad spent a lot of years um, pushing against my grandpa, wanting to get things done his way. He, my grandpa was able to take the company from A to B, and my dad could see B to F, and he said, this is where the, this needs to go. So part of the, the retirement, of, of, of retiring him in 97, partnering with Schnitzer, Schnitzer was able to open us up to some other opportunities, servicing commercial accounts. You know, we bought a couple of used roll-off trucks. So my dad knew where the business needed to grow to, and he knew the family dynamics of what, what it takes to have a father-son relationship when one wants to really grow. So I, my opinion if, of it, maybe you ask my dad, it might be different, is my dad knew how tough it could be if you didn't give them some your kids Rains. some he, sort he, of responsibility responsibility Rains. you know and early give it to them early and give them a crack at you know their way I mean, they're gonna make mistakes and i've made i've made my fair share of mistakes i'd like to think that i've 
I've done pretty decent, but I also know I've made some mistakes along the way. But he was able to recognize the battles he fought with his dad, and he was and he was able to give me a little bit more responsibility earlier than maybe he got, and I think that that's helped both of us. Okay, so your dad just retired, correct? Correct. Yeah. That's fascinating. He's not very old. No, but he's been doing it a long time, and I think. We partnered with Schnitzer in '97. They were a private company. They were not. They weren't. They were Schnitzer. public. Public. They yeah, that's a right. They were publicly traded company. Yeah, Dr. Leonard, Bob Dr. Phillips. Dr. Leonard. I mean, Bob Phillips. Those guys were. You know, those guys helped mold the deal with um, my dad. And so when, two couple years later, they became Schnitzer became a publicly traded company. So, the different dynamics of a publicly traded company and a privately held company. They run things a little bit differently, oh, yeah. right? You know, publicly traded, it's it's very investor, you know, quarterly, you know, driven. Um, as a private, as a privately run company, you your focuses are different. Your focus is longevity, you know, minimizing your uh, tax implications. Sure. Some of those, you know, and there's at your, profit. You go, wait, profit means taxes. Depreciation, and and there's a lot of things that you know that change the dynamic of our relationship over the years. And I would like to think that, you know, we were partners for almost 20 years and we still have a great relationship with Snitzer. I mean, I can't talk highly enough about um, Mike Henderson. I can't talk highly enough about Mike Kirschman and their ability to give us the opportunity to be a family owned business again. They, they could see that we were struggling um, trying to get two different corporate cultures mm -hmm. to really go together. We had two different ways of seeing it. But they knew that if both of us could exit on friendly terms, that that relationship is going to go on for a long time, whether you're joined at the hip or not with your books or, or you're just doing business every day. So you're in charge now, okay? Your dad's retired, grandpa and all this. So now it's Breck at Card Show. You were telling a story about how you found your managers and the challenge of finding the people. Tell us about that because I love this story. I think your your past is what's creating the success you're having now. Tell us a little bit about picking your managers and how and why that your philosophy. Tell us your philosophy behind it. My thing is is this the the reason that we're here today, the reason we have the facilities we have is not because of me. It's because I was able to identify guys along the way that believed in me, that were hard workers, that I could convince, hey, like I have your best interest in mind. Like I want you to be successful. I mean, I want to be successful, but I, along the way, I want us all to be successful. So over the years, I've, you know, I've, there's a couple guys that I'd known from college. I was able to recruit. Um, just some guys that uh, I've met over the years. Um, our CFO, I met him at a bar. And he's now not just the CFO, he's probably one of my best friends. And he's, my mom taught him, and he's now probably the brains of the operation. You know, him and I share an office every day. We spend, we coach my son's basketball team together. But what, I've, what I feel lucky is that I was able to find a bunch of great guys that believed in me and now my responsibility honestly is to take care of them is to basically let them do what they do and make them successful you said something last night that i not that i haven't heard is you said making money is, is easy but making it to where the people in your company make money that's the challenge and that's what drives you yeah the, the biggest thing is Making money isn't easy in this scrap market. Well, right? that's true. But, I mean, but but you know, but but the me is like if you, if you have hustle and you're a grinder and you want to go to work every day, and you can make money. Like you can make money for yourself, and you'll you'll put you'll make it you'll make a decent paycheck. Or if you invest wisely, you'll make money. But the measure of success, for me, personally. Because I'm not a money guy, it doesn't take a lot to appease me. I more, I more gauge my success if I can make my top guys that I was able to convince 10, 12 years ago, 
if I if I got them, you know, got them into a position where they we've built this business together, all of us, then to me, like that's success. Not how many yards you have, how much money you have in your bank account, what kind of pickup truck you drive. Not to me, that's not the measure of success. It's how many guys were you able to, you know, help build out their career and give them the opportunity. They gave you the opportunity to grow your business, invest back in. That's and they're the thriving under that leadership and that program. And that, I think that, I, I love hearing that because that's something I'm going to take back to my business to make sure that my key people, the people that I need to grow for success, are succeeding too. You know, and I think that's fantastic. Hey, Thank you. Know, you. You're in this area, you've got a lot of yards, a lot of distance, and you have a lot of weather. Talk about these challenges of weather and the distance between your yards, and how are you able to manage that? What, what is it? Is it your managers, or what philosophy are you taking with that that helps you do that? You know, I, I, I probably give trust more easily than most. I'm a, I'm a give rope guy. Like, I'll give you all the rope in the world, and what you either you hang yourself with it or you, you build it on an awesome bridge out of it, you know? And to me, I mean, anytime you're dealing with scrap and you're dealing with cash in a cash box, and sure. it, you know, that everybody in this industry knows that that can go sideways on you faster than, you know, you can shake a stick. And, and it's happened to us. It's happened to, I bet anybody that's owned a scrapyard for any length of time, it's happened to. So, but if you just let that stop you from trusting people, you'll never grow your business. Because if you, if you give trust more easily than you take it away, then you have the opportunity to grow. You have, you, you're giving people the opportunity to better themselves. What, what they do with it is up to them. But to me, it's more, if we ever want to grow, you have to trust people. So you, I almost err on the side of maybe sometimes trusting too much. Right. But I feel in the long run it will benefit you because I think more people want to do the right thing. I think more people will do the right thing than won't. You're going to have some, you know, some issues along the way, and it's and it's you put everybody puts uh, these these stop gaps in place to try and minimize those issues. You know, whether it's the computer system for the purchasing or your managers to keep an eye on what's going on. Um, but I, I err probably on the side of trusting more, and. That's what's helped me. You, you, you I, I said think. something. You said something doing the right thing. Can you know what I've noticed about your yards? You're doing the right thing environmentally. Thank you, you. You are clean. You, you you have your storm water in place. You know, when you, our yard in California, trust me, the regulators are all over. So <laughs> we, we're on it, okay? Yeah. But I've noticed you're ahead of that curve. Doing the right thing. Is that part of your, just your, do the right thing, let's get ahead of this environmental curve here. Because your yards are doggone nice, Brett. Thank you. Look, I walk, I've been in hundreds of yards, but you are paved yards, you have your drainage for your storm water. You know what you're doing. You're doing, is that, that's part of you doing the right thing. But where did you get that? You got ahead of the game there. My dad, my dad is, my dad was, you get one chance to do it right when you put a new yard in. So we have some of our older yards that we still have some yards that are dirt and we still have some yards that, but every new yard we put in, if we greenfield at a yard, we do it right out the gate. That way we don't have to come back in and try and fix it. Um, but that's my dad. I mean, my dad taught me. Do you think that ago. has something to do with the Schnitzer group? Because yeah, it has a lot. I, th I think that's a good that's a good point as well. I mean, I think they helped my dad. I mean, they helped mold that into us. I mean, like I like I was saying earlier, there's there's a lot of stuff with Schnitzer and us that we took away that's like huge positives for our business. I mean, it made it matured us. It made us think be more accountable. Um, I mean, to me, I mean, there's there's so, there's a lot of good stuff that came of that, and that's a, I mean, that's a good point. I didn't I didn't really think about that. Is Snitzer, I think, helped mold mold us into that and in, in doing the right thing, you know. You you said something, and that it's it's evident. Okay, look, I, I'm not just anybody who comes to your yard is going to know after they hear this podcast, and somebody comes in here, they're no, I'm not blowing smoke anywhere. The truth is, you come this Boise yard, you're called the, the yard. These things are nice, and you can tell 
you know, they're clean, the housekeeping's there, the storing, you're doing it right. You said something today. You're about making friends, even though you're a competitive dude, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, you're yeah. very competitive, but you're about making friends, coopetition. Yeah. And your friendship still lasts today with the Schnitzer company. Correct. And it didn't end on a sour note. No. We made sure that it didn't end. They made sure, we all made sure it didn't end on a sour note. Is this Brad Eckhart's philosophy, or is this something you learned from Grandpa? Your dad? My dad. Uh, th that's a, that's another. Uh, my dad taught me early. He's like, there's, there's enough scrap for everybody. You don't have to kill yourself over it. You know, there's, if you buy every pound, your price is too high. That's the reality. If nobody's buying anything, your price is too high. So there's a happy medium of being able to run your business. Because you have to make enough money to invest back into your business to have a clean facility. But also, I believe that from our standpoint, you know, we're not the biggest recycling company in the United States. We can't go around and try and step on people's necks. Our, my, our whole goal is to do business with as many other recycling companies as we can. Because there's, you know, there's just... It's a competitive environment already, so Why you're going to compete. You're going to compete every day, and we do compete every day. And you know, so that's like part of the deal. Practice in football, offense versus you guys got to compete. Yeah, you're on the same team, but you still got to compete to make the other guy better. Yep. You know, in Bakersfield, okay, our scrapyard, half a mile down the street, SA has a six thousand horsepower shutter. We trade iron every month. We trade metals every month. And, you know, making friends as you go, I, I buy into that. And, mm -hmm. I, and it's great to hear it from you because, but it's interesting. All the things we're taught, you know, I like to take credit for some, you know, it's our fathers and that yeah. really taught us so much. But your dad, now let's talk about teaching a lesson. I heard something today that I just loved. Your dad had to <laughs> teach, you, teach you a lesson. About a car, because of when you were a younger knucklehead, you did some things, and you you thought your dad wasn't serious about it. Tell us this story. This is a funny story. So when I was in, uh, before I got my driver's license, and in, in Idaho, you can drive when you turn 15. You can drive it in the daylight. You can't drive at night. Um, now I think they've changed the rules to where you have to drive with somebody for a few months. But in Idaho, you when I was when I was growing up, you could drive at 15 um, without an adult as long as you had your permit. So when I was 14, I had picked out this uh, Pontiac Firebird that came in as scrap, but it was a little bit nicer than scrap. It was something that was could be a daily driver if it just if you put a little bit of love into it. So we set it aside and, and over time, over the year, I'd find parts and speaker boxes and <laughs> anything I could to get this thing fixed up to make it my car when I turned 15 I could drive it. And it wasn't a nice car. It was an old it was an older car, but it was going to be cool for but me. But it still 15. it was your car. It was my car, right? I bought it bought it from the scrapyard and uh, set it aside and uh, I got I was kind of a squirrely kid at times. <laughs> and I got into like got into a little bit of trouble. My dad basically said, "Here's the deal. If you get in trouble again, then we're going to crush the car." And I was like, "Oh, okay. I and, you know, when you're 14 going on 15, you pretty much think you know everything and nobody's going to tell you, at least I was bullheaded enough to think that nobody's <laughs> going to tell me what I could do, what I couldn't do. And I messed up again, and my dad said, all right, time to crush the car. And we crushed the car. <sighs> what crushed was that the... like? Come on, man. Tell well, us, Brett. I mean, you're I at had... the handles of the car. Yeah, I was, I was so looking forward to driving that <laughs> crappy Firebird, but it was my going to be my Firebird, and my dad... On that, I mean, one thing I learned from that is if my dad says it, it's going to happen. Is it, is it going to happen on your timeline? Maybe not. But if, if he says it's going to happen, he's going to stick to it. Right. And I Come on now. I want to hear it. What was it like? Yeah. You're, you're pulling the levers of the car flattener. Yeah, you're you, what was that like? And we had the old school car crusher where you had levers, not like the remote controls, right. like the easy crushers we have now. So you have to pull the levers and crush your own car. That's pretty disheartening. <laughs> It's a pretty tough, but I, I feel like I got, I feel like I got something out of it. I feel like I, uh, I learned a lesson, you know, I learned, Hey, 
I probably shouldn't be doing that. And B, if my dad said it, it's going to happen. Are you, you gonna are you gonna post that on your two boys? I hope to. I mean, I hope. I mean, I. Feel That's like a I, great man. I, I feel I, like I'm thinking. Oh man, bad. I got my son a new truck. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, I got it because I, I got my kid the truck. That my both my kids' cars have collision avoidance. Yeah. Because kids don't pay attention like adults. All right. It's a new truck. It's a new Ford F one fifty. I'm like, man, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah. Son, I'm going to flatten your car. <laughs> you can know. just put a for sale sign on it and uh, just say we'll sell it. Let's at least get some get money back out of All it. All right, well, let's talk about something that you and I both, you know, we're both fathers. You know, my, my daughter's 20, student at USC. My son's 17, uh, so, uh, junior in, in high school. But I coached my kids. I love coaching them. Yeah. And you being the former athlete, um, you're coaching your boys. Yeah. It's the greatest Love thing on it. It's awesome. I mean, I wouldn't trade it for I wouldn't trade it for anything. That's kind of my sweet spot as far as like with my kids. I mean, that's my kid time. I carve that time out. No matter what I'm doing, phone's in the truck. Like that's my time with the kids. Yeah, it's, it's, that for me, look, I, I when it comes to coaching, I, I that's what I, I if I could quit my day job and make as much money and coach, I'd be coaching. Yeah. I love coaching. Now, with all that's going on in football, with the head stuff and what have you, you going to let your boys play football? I'm going to wait. I'm going to let them play when they get older. So in, over here in Idaho, we could play at fifth grade tackle football. Mm -hmm. So my boys in fourth grade right now, I have a, I have a fourth grader and I have a kindergarten. So they both play flag football. Okay. Which they didn't, I didn't have that option growing up. It was soccer until f through fourth grade, tackle football at fifth grade. So your first year of playing organized football was tackle football. But you're going to wait. What year were you like? See, I didn't let my son play tackle football until he was eighth grade. Yeah. And he was good. It's like, it didn't matter. Yeah. Because he was an athlete. Did not matter. He was a hell of a basketball player, heck of a baseball player. Didn't matter. And a friend of mine who played in the NFL, who, had, who retired because he had six concussions, said that he's waiting until eighth grade because at four, 13, 14, that, which is eighth grade, that the, the brain doesn't wobble in your skull you know, there's, because it's still growing. Uh -huh. And so that's why he, he told me this. And he's in the medical industry, and he's a Stanford grad. The guy's smart than hell, yeah. way smarter than me. So I kind of went, well, that made sense. So I, I didn't let John Carlo play until eighth grade. What about you? I think that's eighth, eighth, ninth grade. I mean, I'll kind of play it by year, but I think that's probably a good age. Over here, you can play flag football all the way through ninth grade, and I think flag football teaches you the game. My son is a big, is a big kid. My oldest, both of my boys are big kids. I mean, you know, my wife is five foot ten. Oh boy! My father-in-law played football, and he played at Utah State. Okay. So it's we football is in our blood. DNA. I mean, we we like it, <laughs> but it, so the, and they're very driven kids. But I think the longer you can pull the reins back, and football is kind of a unique sport in my opinion because you can be, if you're a good athlete, you, we can teach you how to tackle, we can teach you like the, if, if you're aggressive, mm -hmm. even by the time you get to ninth grade, I think you'll be fine. But I, I still think that there's really no need to, to bang your body up at, from fifth grade on. I mean, I think you can, and I think that if, if, if there's, there's, there's probably as much um, research out there that says they'll be just fine, just like anything. There's, there's, there's research out there that says it's hurting them. There's research out there that says it's just fine. I think it's personal preference. I mean, and if your kid's saying, I got to do it, I got to do it, and that's their, that's what they want to do, I mean, as a parent, I, I, you, I guess it's a, it's a case-by-case no, case situation. I, I, I agree, man. It's just, I had to bring it up because, you know, yeah. that's, so is your dream for your kids... Okay, now I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna go back. There, your grandpa had a dream for your dad. Your dad had a dream for you. Mm -hmm. Is your dream for your kids different? Any different than what they had for? Or, because see, my dream for my kids is just one thing. I just want them to be happy. It, it, my dad's dream was to have me in the business. Okay. Yeah. That that was set forth when I was a young kid. Okay. Mm -hmm. But my dream now for my kids is different. I just want them happy. Yeah. I, it's just be happy, man. That's all I want. How's your dream for your kids different than your father's dream for you? 
You know, I, I have a funny story. So my grandpa, um, he, the, guy, the man that started United Metals in 1972, he died when my oldest, the same year my oldest boy was born. So I'm was the last Eckhart. There's no other, uh, nobody else in my family, you know, I was the last male that could have a kid and make an Eckhart. Um, I had a cousin, Justin, who uh, had a daughter and he didn't have any boys. So it, it was really, it was, I was the last one. And my grandpa knew that. My grandpa and I had a close relationship, you know, because I, I, I spent so much time at the scrapyard and around. I was always around him. So he knew if I didn't have a boy, then there's no more Eckhart's, right? right. And he was a pretty proud man and very family centric, family driven. Um, but so when I, I, my wife and I got married, a year later we found out she's pregnant. And then, you know, I was like three, four, five months, whatever that timeline is when you can figure out if it's going to be a boy or a girl. And so when we found out, I mean, I'm sitting there with my wife, and I've got I've had this pressure on me since I've been 15, <laughs> 15 years old. I've known that I'm the last I'm the last one, unless I make a boy, right? And at this at this point, you just want the kid to be healthy. Like, sure. Just just give me a healthy kid. I'll boy girl it doesn't really matter. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm super nervous. The day I'm like, okay, we're going in. My wife and I, and we're sitting there. She's laying there, and they do the ultrasound. And they're like, do you guys want to know? And I'm like. Yes. I go, I've been wanting to know since I've been 15, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so they go, all right, it's going to be a boy. And I was like this, and I just go, <sighs> like, my wife's like, I've never heard you give such a big sigh of relief ever since I've known you. And I was like, oh, you don't understand the pressure <laughs> I've been under for so many years. So when my, so when my grandpa, you know, he's, he's on, he's, he was in rough shape. And we have this last family picture when my son's one, he's not even one yet, he's a month old. My grandpa, my dad, me, four generations in the Holling building, in the where the arch is at. And that's a big, that's a big deal. It was a big deal for him. It was a big deal for my dad. I mean, it was a big deal for me. And that's one of those like pictures wow. that you just, and he, I think that, that helped him like, you know, when he died, it was like, all right, all right. there's, the a, there's another one. So coming. the dream of continuing the Eckhart yeah. name. So your dream for your kids? I want them to be happy. I want them to. Uh, I want them to earn what they get. Ah. I want them everything they get. I want them to earn. I don't want anything given, other than the opportunity to be successful. What I will give you the opportunity, but you have to then take that opportunity and do something with it. If, I think if you just give it to them, then they don't ever earn it. And if, if, you, if you give them the opportunity and make them earn it, they appreciate it. And I think that's what my mom and dad have done for me is given me the opportunity. And so every day I wake up driven to earn it, right? Right. So then when I get it, I appreciate it because I know what, what we've done to get, to get it. That's... I could definitely relate to that. All right, I'm going to circle back to one last thing. We're going to wrap this up. Okay. You're, you've been out there on social media. You're out there on LinkedIn, and you're out there on uh, Instagram. And, you know, you, you posted something that I, to me, it's like the post of the year. You had a truck that got in a wreck, and you posted that telling everybody, putting it out there, Hey everybody, weather's bad. This stuff happens. We gotta watch ourselves. I yeah. think that's to me. It was the post of the year. You put yourself out there. Tell us about making that decision because I think that's one of the most fascinating posts. Now, all this social media that we're doing, like this podcast, is part of our social media program, and, and people hear this. But you put yourself out there, Brett. You know, I I feel like. My generation, generations younger, everybody wants to show you all the good things that happen in their life, in their family, in their business. And LinkedIn, to me, is more business driven. Then that's why I like it. I don't do Facebook. I don't do anything else. I I just do LinkedIn because all day, every day, I, I'm I, I all I'm thinking about is what we're doing, you know, at work right. when I'm not with my family. So I think it's important for people to know that. We all have shitty days, man, and things happen to us, and they happen to our business, and 
it's not necessarily um, anything that we did wrong or anything like that. It's something that happens and you have to know how to deal with it or learn how to deal with it. So maybe a follow-up post for me coming down the line will be how we sorted stuff out with our insurance or how we sorted stuff out with our safe, you know, our driver safety meeting or something along those lines. But I wanted people to know that you're not, when something happens to one of your trucks, something happens to one of your excavators, to your shears, it happens to all of us. And if you just only post the good things, then I think you're kind of creating this like fake facade of your business. And I want people to know like we're human, like we're a real company. Like we, we're fighting real challenges every day, you know, where we're fighting hard to find uh, labor. It's hard to find CDL truck drivers. And things are happening every day that aren't just all roses and gold coins. It's, it's real business I, every day. I gotta tell you, post of the year. It, Thank you. It, it is, needs to be said, you know, look, I was chairman of ISRI. And when I was chairman of ISRI, the recycling industry was the fourth deadliest industry in America. Today, we're number five. Do I like to think that I had a little bit to do with making safety consciousness on a higher level? A team at ISRI helped do this. Your post is going to help people have that safety meeting. Your post is going to help companies go, hey, inclement weather is coming. Winter is here. Yeah. Okay. I just came out of Indiana. It was below you know, 15 degrees. Roads were slick. There was ice. And I think somebody's going to do something, and it's going to save somebody's life. And I commend you for that. I commend you for being brave. To have the courage to put it out there, Brett. This is going to happen. Everybody, let's watch it. I appreciate that. And I, hopefully, I mean, if, you, if it helps, if you say if it helps save one life or helps create the conversation. I take, I, I read AMM or I read articles about what's going on in the scrap industry and an accident happens, somebody cut in, do a tank, or somebody, something happens, right? Right. And I, th those, are, those are immediate safety meetings for us. So I push those to our managers and I say, hey guys, like this happens, like accidents happen. Nobody intended for this to happen, but they happen. So how do we get in front of it? And, you know, use this as a opportunity so, to learn. So this was our opportunity, or my opportunity to put it out there and say, these things happen, you know, you, you don't you don't fold your business up and you know call it quits. You figure out how to get through it, and th it sucks. Every you know every piece of it sucks. But if you, I mean, if I want people to know that it, we're a real company, we fight the same challenges you do every day, and we're, you know, we're we're just trying to get through it like everybody else. Crappy markets, good markets, whatever <laughs> it is, like we're on the grind every day. Brett, thank you, thank you for sharing with us. A great story. Just thank you for being you and let, telling it like it is. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Brad. It. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Finally, in person. Yeah. This has been a Sierra International Machinery original audio series. Thanks for listening. Please share this podcast and make sure to subscribe.